thing that says live. Ah, here we go. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for this special live edition of Toolkit's Memoir, which is presented by Express Media. Um, and it is honestly so lovely to be here for another, um, another session with another amazing author. Um, so before I introduce the wonderful Eleanor Savage, I wanted to pay my respects and acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that I'm coming to you from, um, who are the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people. Um, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and future. And of course, extend that to um, the traditional custodians of the lands that all of you are joining us from. Um, and I'd like to particularly pay respect to the long and wonderful tradition of storytelling um, that First Nations Australians have had and continued for thousands of years. And we're really lucky to be able to write and create work um, in this wonderful country. So with that said, I would also like to say how thrilled I am to be speaking to Eleanor Savage tonight. Um, actually, one of the cool things about um, being the facilitator for this course is I get to pick writers who I think are awesome and then I get to talk to them um, in front of other people for an hour, so that's pretty great. Um, to tell you a little bit about Eleanor, her essay collection Blueberries is out now, has been out for just a few months um, with Text Publishing and Scribe UK. Eleanor's writing examines the unbreakable nexus of intimate and public and has previously appeared in Sydney Review of Books, Paris Review Daily, Mianjin, Cordite and The Lifted Brow, of which she was also a former editor. She holds a PhD in creative writing with a focus on feminist literary criticism and the contemporary essay. And she's a 2019-2021 Martin Bequest traveling scholar. So I imagine you're not doing a huge amount of traveling at the moment, I'm just glad that you're here with us. Um, and I should um, admit to you, Eleanor, that many years ago when I was judging the Scribe Nonfiction Prize, you entered a um, an excerpt, a version of Blueberries um, oh, to that. Yeah. And I read it and I absolutely loved it. Um, it was one of the most exciting pieces that I got to read during that selection process. And I can say candidly that um, judging things is one of my least um, one of the least enjoyable things I get to do. And I say that as someone who judged the Stella Prize for this year, um, which was great, but really hard because you read a lot of amazing work um, and it's hard to be really critical about it, but sometimes a piece um, really stands out and yours is definitely that for me. So it's really exciting that it's now a book um, and that you know, the rest of the world can enjoy it. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. No worries. And tell us a little bit about um, what it's been like having the book out in the world. What have the last couple of months um, been like for you knowing that, you know, something that you've laboured over is out and people are actually able to read it? It's a deeply abstract experience. I feel very little connection to um, other people's connections to my book. Did you have that experience as well, Zoya? Kind of. Yeah, but I think, like, again, not to make this all about um, the weird circumstances we're in, but I was really thrust into a few months of just, like, a lot of promotion and publicity and travelling a lot for festivals and things like that. And so at least yeah. it felt quite contained, um, like it was a period of time. Um, and a lot of, like, I, I think the weird thing about having a book out for me was that for some part of the time you're, like, the author Zoya Patel and the rest of the time you're, like, just me working my day job living my life normally, making beans on toast, you know, like all the all the regular stuff. So I don't know if you have that kind of dissonance sometimes. Possibly, yeah. And it's probably like I feel like I'm not really connected to anything that is happening with my book in the world outside my life because I, you know, I didn't get to go to the events. I didn't get to go to the festivals. I'm like trapped in my little – it's not even my apartment. I'm like subletting. Um, so – yeah, I kind of maybe missed out on that kind of experience of touring a book, which would have been kind of fun and exciting. Um, but I think in general, like reading reviews, like I, of course I read them all and I want people to like my book. I want it to do well. I want it to sell copies. I want it to like make my publisher like a few hundred dollars, hopefully. Oh, I'm like, I might cover that up. Um, but at the same time, I like when I'm reading critiques, it doesn't feel like, my work is being critiqued. It doesn't feel like a part of me is being critiqued. It feels like something else that and maybe it came from me, maybe it didn't, but it's not my responsibility anymore. And it's quite, it's quite liberating to finally be free of that book and let it just have its life out there. I've definitely heard other authors talk about that feeling of kind of, um, and in fact, there's an essay that um, I get everyone to read in this course right at the beginning called um, by Philippa Guinness called The Book Has Left Me. 
um, which is kind of about that feeling of like, it's done, it's done. You have this kind of emotional breakup in a way from it where you, you feel quite, well, I know that I feel quite drained and exhausted and just glad that it's that when you're actually getting a book published, of course, it isn't the same because even though you feel relief that the drafting is over, you're then facing like months of editing and having to look at those words and work with them. So for me, I felt the most excited when it like went off to the printers and I couldn't think about it anymore from the perspective of changing it or meddling with it. Um, okay. So that's the exciting thing. Yeah, you have these kind of personal milestones when you're producing the manuscript and you're working on it with an editor or you're working on it with yourself, you know, for so long and you kind of like finish the first draft and that's really exciting. And then, yeah, having I was I remember being really nervous just before it came out because there's a lot of kind of personal stuff in it and I was certain that I'd be judged harshly for my life choices and the kind of person that I am. And of course, like, I mean, no one really cares about the life choices of other people. <laughs> so mm. that didn't happen. Um, but as soon as it, yeah, it kind of left my hands and I feel really comfortable with it. Yeah. I think there's something interesting in what you've just said that I want to kind of circle back to around what happens with memoir when you kind of, you stop being the, um, the sole owner of your experiences and your stories because you've shared them publicly and you almost become a bit of a character. So I'm going to park that because before we talk about that, I want to give people a little bit um, of context around you and your kind of writing journey. So um, tell us a bit about how you came to writing Blueberries and um, just a little bit about what kind of work you're most interested in, what kinds of um, things you had done beforehand that might have led to this point. Yeah, I kind of um, started, I imagined that I was a poet when I started writing. And I think that's been um, probably that was really educational and quite it's informed my writing a lot and then the kind of next stage of my writing my early writing career if you can call it that um I wrote a lot about politics for the internet I wrote op-eds I wrote like essays I wrote comic pieces they were usually always tied to kind of um politics mm. cultural politics and Australian politics um and so I had that kind of like that's that experience of writing that kind of nonfiction. And so the kind of combination of a kind of um, some, a little bit of a poetic, you know, an, an education, a self-education self in poetry and that kind of other education in, in writing about uh, issues, real things, difficult things. Um, Mm. Yeah, that probably led me to the kind of like the writing that I'm doing now, which is, yeah, it's memoir, but it's also essay. Um, I'm often using poetic forms. Um, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say that, that um, reading the work, uh, there's definitely like a strong poetic element that that kind of comes through. And it isn't, um, it isn't traditional memoir. So, um, you know, I think a lot of people have a really fixed sense of what memoir can be. And certainly in the mainstream, that is, um, I think people, and I say this often, really conflate memoir and autobiography and um, often think that, you know, you know, I'm sure you've had the question and certainly I've had the question of how could you possibly write memoir? You're so young. What what possible yeah. reflections could you have on your life? But of course your work is actually quite um it's almost um like cultural theory mixed with memoir. There's a lot of um there's a lot going on in terms of really talking about the world and society and feminism and us um through the lens of your experience and um the writing is quite experimental in a lot of ways. So why did you choose memoir as the vessel for how you tell this story? Why not write kind of straight nonfiction the way that a lot of your other work has been? Yeah, I I mean, I I teach nonfiction at uni and I, I'm always coming, when I'm thinking about nonfiction as a writer, I'm never thinking like, oh, I'm writing a work of memoir today or I'm writing, uh, I mean, unless I've got a commission and I've like signed a contract and I have to write, you know, a piece of criticism or something, then you follow the rules. But if you're writing for yourself, like I don't start with a, and I, a, a kind of limited idea of what genre I'm going to be writing in or to or through. I start with the kind of, um, the idea and I think of the form and then maybe it ends up that a fairly straight piece of memoir maybe it ends up something more experimental um, maybe it ends up a poem um, I don't know when I start and I think that like when when we're talking about genre we're always talking about a kind of um, 
commercial and institutional um, way of categorizing work so that it literally fits in the Dewey Decimal System or in a bookshop. And so there's a, there can be a clear kind of marketing plan or, you know, it's about like that kind of taxonomy is happening um, for really like great and useful reasons, but they're really different reasons to why I'm writing and why a lot of creative writers are writing in the first place. So that genre stuff is often happening um, post-publication. Mm. Yeah, I get that. But I also um, I also know that from the like quite practical perspective of a writer wanting to have work out in the world and to actually, you know, see it published, a level of that kind of more um, banal almost categorization has to happen, right? So yes. I think it's actually pretty awesome that your book retains this really unique voice um, and that the like honestly I find the the way that you write, um, the kind of the narration style the kind of insertions of different voices even through your personal perspective um it's quite exciting it's very experimental and it's very different um and I find it really like a pleasure to read but it makes me think quite a lot not the easiest type of writing to pitch to a publisher though so um how did you get to the point of publication with it and did you ever feel as if you were going to have to shoehorn those ideas into a more kind of conservative form yeah, I mean, I've, I guess I kind of made a decision with this book and with my kind of writing career more generally, I discovered how pleasureless I find certain forms of professional writing. Like they make mm -hmm. me really sad. Um, and so I kind of, yeah, I realized that the kind of writing that I really want to do and that I, I mean, that I'm not even capable of doing yet, but I want to get to a point where I can be capable of pulling off certain, certain styles or forms or ideas. Uh, I realized that I wasn't going to kind of be able to support myself financially doing that work. And so I had to find other ways of, um, yeah, like literally just getting a job and getting some training to be able to support myself, um, yeah. not just from my writing. Because if you're trying to sell your work, you need to be able to even just like understand the genres that you're working in and understand the kind of parameters um, of those genres and understand why editors are looking for those kinds of um, genre markers. Uh, and they're not like, they're not bad. You can yeah. produce extremely beautiful and important work within those parameters, but you have to know how to pull them off and you yeah. have to be committed to them as well. And I, think I, that's still do that. and I still often do that kind of writing when I need money or when it's a good kind of, I have something to say in it and the form might actually like I want to write a kind of op-ed or I want to write a piece of straight memoir for a magazine or something um but I can't rely on that in my writing career so I have to yeah find other ways of paying my bills I actually find that really refreshing because I think something that we don't talk about very often especially when um you get to a kind of point in your career where you know you do achieve publication you're um you're kind of entering the ranks of being um, a professional writer is the fact that most professional writers have to have some other form of income. You know, it's actually really difficult to make ends meet on a writer salary. And I mean, often that happens in the form of um, things like teaching courses, um, events, speaking, you know, editing things. Um, there's a whole range of different ways that you can kind of cobble together writing related things um, to build a career. But I mean, one thing that I've always been really candid about is the fact that I work a full-time job. Like, yeah. I work in marketing. Um, I really like it sometimes. I don't, you know, it's not my um, my passion, but um, mm -hmm. I'm not living my bliss. But um, at the same time, it gives me a lot of freedom, um, as you said, in terms of what I choose to write. Um, and I think yeah. that that's a really good message, actually, to give to emerging writers as well. Um, but still, at the point at which you then had this manuscript that you'd worked on and that you were pleased with and that you were ready to do things with, um, you know, going back to what I said at the beginning where you had submitted a part of Blueberries to um, different competitions and things like that. Yeah. Um, was that you kind of feeling it out and trying to see where um, the next step would be for that manuscript or had you already kind of thought about what, what process you wanted to take that forward with? Like were you thinking I'll submit this to publishers or were you thinking um, I just want to see how people react to this work and respond to it before I kind of take the next step? Well, I was... I mean, I was kind of committed to the book at that stage, but that was probably because I was doing a PhD in creative writing and so there's a kind of manuscript component and I had the freedom. I had the, like a scholarship which paid me for a couple of years to, I mean, you know, like supplemented my income for a couple of years so that I could 
Um, imagine a book outside of uh, like a pitching session with an editor, which is like the most amazing freedom that you can't, I mean, I was going to say that money can't buy, but money can buy it and it costs $25,000 a year. You know? <laughs> so that's another way of like a lot of writers are doing that now. Like if you have gone through the system and you can get like into a postgraduate course, it can be a way of buying time to work on your craft and work on your ideas so that you get to a point where you you know that you have a book and you're ready to kind of like defend that book and wait for the, the right publisher instead of like, because I feel like there were some, uh, along the way, there are a few like moments at which I could have uh, taken the book in another direction on the advice of an editor and it would have ended up being a different kind of book and maybe not the book that I wanted to write. Yeah. And so having that like, yeah, another thing, another source of money coming in. Yeah. Made it possible for me to just go like, no, no, this is the book that I want to write. And if no one wants to publish it, like someone will publish it. I'll publish it. You know, like I don't care. I'll print it out on pieces of paper and, and put it in the mail. I don't know. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I kind of love that um, that passion and dedication you have to the craft, um, which is really like the driving thing that makes us want to be writers that kind of creates the urge to write in the first place. Um, but I want to come back to this idea of um, memoir and particularly this idea of using lived experience to kind of springboard into other things. So, you know, this session is called Life is Research. Um, and I'm really interested in that because when you kind of propose that as a theme for this session, I was like, huh, I'd never really thought about it that way. Like when I wrote my memoir, I didn't, I wasn't thinking about my life as research or even the way that I used memoir to talk about broader topics as mm -hmm. um, being that interrogative um, really. So that's quite an interesting way of, of thinking about it. How do you, how did you approach the the kind of thesis of the book? And when you say life as research, what do you really mean by that? Yeah. So, I mean, nonfiction is always like written under the burden of facts. And they can be the facts of your experience, the facts of your feelings, uh, the facts of time, um, and then obviously the more kind of uh, verifiable, falsifiable facts of history, science, you know, the things that we know, um, mm -hmm. although we presume to know. <laughs> um, and so life as research is, I mean, for me, that can include many things. It can be like, I mean, in your memoir, you're like, your life is the kind of document that gives evidence for the arguments that you're making. Mm. And that is a form of like using your life as a form of research. And then there are other kind of like strategies that memoirists use that I'm really interested in. I just read um, The Girls by Chloe Higgins. I'm not sure if you've read mm -hmm. it. Good. Um, yeah. And she does this thing where she's like, uh, her memory falters as, you know, all memoirists when you're writing, you're like, how did it really happen? I can't be sure. And you yeah. go back and like ask someone who was around at that time and you say, is this how it happened? And in her book, she like, those kind of conversations that she has with her parents, she calls them up and she'll say, what what, what, what happened then? Mm -hmm. And they'll give a really different account of what happened. And she builds that into the narrative and it becomes another perspective in the narrative. So it deepens the, um, it deepens the thinking and the remembering. Um, so that's another form of like life as research. You're, you're using memoir to kind of document um, the the fluctuations of memory and storytelling and memory keeping. Um, but then there are really practical elements of life as research for me in my practice, and that's like I have a, I have a an email account that goes back to 2004, maybe, and so I have. Um, and I've like been a really prolific emailer my whole life. Well, since I had email, yeah. so I have all these documents um, of who I was ten years ago, fifteen years ago, and it's really a great resource. And I also keep. I moved a lot in my twenties, so I had to get rid of some of them. But I have like I keep a really like every day. This is my daily planner, and it's got like everything that I did every single day. And so when I'm, like, doing that kind of historical writing, I literally, like, get out my diary and I'm, like, what was really going on? Because you can have a, like, false yeah. recollection of the kind of the order of events. You can have a false recollection of what your daily life was. But when you kind of realise, you're, like, oh, my God, I was dating that, like, maniac. 
And <laughs> I forgot that. Like I, I will, like I, I rose that from my, I erased it from my memory. Um, but then you have these documents. So it's also, it doesn't lie. <laughs> it's using the documents from your life uh, as kind of evidence. You're not, you know, you're not trying to prove anything with it, but you're using them as a guide. Mm. I find that, um, first of all, I'm really impressed by your diligence with your planner because I feel like every year I'm like, I'm going to do it this year and I just um, I never make it work. Um, actually, at the beginning of this year, I was like all about doing a bullet journal and for the first oh five years, Oh, for the first five days of January, I did this like spectacular bullet journal with like illustrations and like I bought like a set. I went to an art store and bought a set of like colored felt tip pens and then, you know, coronavirus hit and I was like, oh, like there's really no point documenting my move from like the dining. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I had such dreams and like you're that person. You're the person who's actually doing it. Um, journals, journals are a great resource um, in that sense. Yeah. And so are other people, of course, but what you say about, um, about Chloe's work and what I think refers back to your work is this idea of kind of acknowledging that we ourselves can be unreliable narrators yeah. and, you know, our version, especially in memoir, like our version is only one version. And you, um, you know, we put an excerpt from your book up for the toolkits participants to read and I was rereading it today and thinking you really um, interrogate every element of your memory um, and not just your memory but your decisions the motivations that you had as you were doing you know this or that thing the way that you present yourself um, on the page you're constantly going you know forcing I guess the version of Eleanor that's on the page to reckon with what else could be going on and all of the kind of um, other motivations all of the other factors that could be influencing the way that you were in in the sections that you're kind of sharing with us um, why did you choose to have that technique what were you what were you hoping that would achieve and um was it hard to be that interrogative of yourself yeah I I tend to think that um the most interesting memoir interrogates memory it doesn't just kind of give the account it interrogates the account as well and I think that's because like I mean, we're all kind of capable of self-delusion. It's probably, it's so easy to delude ourselves. Yeah. And it's not interesting to be in the presence of someone else's self-delusion because if you're a witness to that, you can kind of see through it. Um, and so it's really disappointing to read people's uh, accounts of themselves, which are grandiose, delusional, um, and not facing up to maybe like um, their own mistakes or their own complicity in their mistakes, whatever. Yeah. So, um, I was interested in kind of telling that story in Yellow City because it's like also an account of a sexual assault that I experienced when I was 18. I mm. kind of needed to not have the narrative that was just like um, I was a vulnerable person and something terrible happened to me. Like I don't mm. want to be, I don't want my life to be kind of like calculated in that genre and I don't think anyone wants to be kind of like to understand themselves through that kind of um, narrative, which is not a yeah. real narrative. It's much more complicated than that. And I don't mean like sexual assault is complicated. I mean like when you're a person who's lived through something traumatic that you're you're not just one thing. Yeah. You're all really things. Um, and so I was using that strategy and that technique to, to really like to find out for myself what it was that I had lived through um, because also trauma affects your memory. We all, as we all know, it kind of like makes it impossible to remember certain things mm -hmm. or it makes it really difficult to kind of face up to certain parts of a narrative. Mm -hmm. um, and so using that, yeah, that interrogative um, technique, I was trying to, to kind of push myself as a person to remember properly um, mm -hmm. and then also to, to kind of forgive myself for not being able to account for that. 24 hours or whatever it was. I think that's quite um, interesting in and of itself. I think you raised some really a whole bunch of really interesting stuff there, um, including, I guess, the way in which um, memoir isn't as straightforward as um, this happened and I want to use it to talk about this thing over here. Um, it's also influenced by personal politics. Um, in your case, I can sense a strong feminism, um, you know, wanting to um, also build in kind of, not just um, your perspective, but how you want a reader to be able to interpret and interrogate the work that you're giving them. Um, but something that 
I think a lot of writers struggle with and particularly emerging writers when they're at the point where they're first starting out with memoir and there's a there's a lot of kind of um, common issues that come up again and again that one that's quite relevant to what you were just saying is this sense of self um, accountability and objectivity so how do you um, you know how can writers um, ensure that they're not indulging themselves in the way that they write themselves in the past um, because that's what memoir ultimately is right and I know that I've certainly grappled um, because I kind of see myself as a bit of an essayist as well and um, you know lived experience is always going to be part of that um, I sometimes question whether I'm just really vain and that's why I can't stop going over things that have happened you know in my life um, or the way that I think about things and I think there is something that we all fear about being indulgent in in the writing that we do when we put ourselves on the page. Um, how do you how do you kind of um, speak to that? I know you also teach um, mm -hmm. writing at times. Like, how do you how do you deal with that when people come to you with those kinds of questions? What would you say to the emerging writer about trying to have some kind of practice of objectivity and self accountability in their work? Yeah, I would. I, I mean, I always just kind of say, like, um, like reach out into the world outside of yourself. Like, mm -hmm. read, um, talk to people outside of your experience or or in your experience, but, like, get their perspective. Um, so I think, like, acknowledging your kind of the debts in your thinking, the debts of your material existence, situating yourself um, in a body of work that's influenced your work can be a way of kind of like removing it from just like pure like ego indulgence you're kind mm -hmm. of like writing into a, a genre that you've been moved by like that you don't just kind of arrive in the world and you think I'm going to be a memoirist like you decide to be a memoirist because you've read some brilliant work in the past and you think like this is telling me something about my life or my experience and I want to participate in this um in this collective project mm -hmm. so you're kind of just you're not trying to make a hero of yourself. You're trying to, yeah, like um, contribute to a, a chorus of voices. Yeah. That, yeah, and pass something on to an, another person. And that can mean, like, in, in really practical terms, that can mean just citing other people, using mm -hmm. other texts, um, interviewing people or, like, recounting conversations with permission, of course, from those people. Um, mm -hmm. And... And talking about like some of the things that you might be experiencing personally that are, that are kind of driving you to write, um, mm. recognizing that these are not you're not you're not the first person to have experienced these things, and that there's like there's a history behind everything that's happening to you. Mm, I really like this idea of kind of situating yourself in the world as a writer, not kind of allowing that insularity to kind of pervade as you're going through the process of writing and actually actively thinking about how your work is meant to live, um, you know, alongside other works or within the kind of scope of the world that it'll be going into. Um, of course, that can be sometimes hard to picture when you're writing, especially if it takes a number of years to to really write the work that you're writing. Because um, I know that if I look at things that I wrote even a couple of years ago, I read them now and I know that the way that I would write them would be quite different. Um, and it's not that my mind has changed, but the way that um, we think and the way that we write is actually constantly evolving yeah. in a way that we're not always aware of. Um, how long have you worked on blueberries and did you find it hard to kind of retain that sense of um, where you wanted the book to sit in the world and also what you were trying to say over the course of however long that was? Yeah, I started writing it in 2015 and I finished it I guess like 2000, like early last year, um, and then I was just doing edits for the rest of the year. Yeah, so that's like quite a long time, and I was in this kind of like age bracket that like when I started writing it, I was like in a really particular kind of um, life situation. I was like living in share houses and I was working in hospitality and I was really broke all the time and I was really angry and I like couldn't afford to buy a pair of shoes and then I kind of like I developed some like um say you know <laughs> some employment skills and um I stopped being so broke and I got you know I had the scholarship um and so I stopped being as precarious and mm -hmm. 
I like what you were saying before about like you, yeah, you're kind of reading back on stuff you wrote five years ago and you don't really recognize the thinking. It's a different person. So I have had to go through um, kind of a, an experience of understanding that that woman who was writing at the time, like writing blueberries, for example, she's different to me, but I don't like hate her or think that she's invalid just because I would write it differently now because my experience would be different now. Mm. Um, I'm kind of seeing her as like one of the many voices in that kind of chorus of like mm. people thinking about the truth of their experience in a particular time and place. And I can even like, I find that I really, I still really like that essay, even though I know I can see it's like, it's many technical flaws. I can see some embarrassing like thinking happening, mm. but at the same time I'm like, um, this is like, this is an impressive rendition of like what I was, thinking and feeling at the time and it's the best I could have done with the, yeah. the materials at my disposal. So I think you have to be kind of generous to your former selves and acknowledge that they've done the best that they could. <laughs> I like that actually because um, even as you said, you know, I don't um, I don't hate her, that, that version of me from before. I thought, oh, that's interesting because you automatically, um, and I feel like maybe this is a, a thing that we shared, uh, you automatically were like, well, if you're looking back and you didn't relate necessarily to the way that your past self thought, you would probably react to that negatively. And you're right, right? Like I have this terrible tendency of reading things that Zoya five years ago wrote and being quite condescending to myself. Like, oh, <laughs> like, when I were 25, isn't that funny? Like I can't um, allow those feelings and those thoughts to be validated because I've yeah. just grown beyond and but actually what you're saying is um and what you're reminding me of is that the flip side of that is sometimes when you read work that um you're quite far away from just in terms of time you're actually really pleasantly surprised because you yeah. read a phrase or a thought and um it's beautifully crafted and you think huh like I didn't I didn't know that I could do that like yeah. that's that's really quite nice to know that I had the ability to to write that nice that you know perfectly posed thing that right now I wouldn't necessarily think of because mm -hmm. I guess that's the flip side is that um, even when some of the writing that you do in the past isn't um, to the quality that you think you could produce now, you also can't write the way that you write in any singular moment again. Like, yeah. you know, you're kind of, some of the energy in the, um, the essays that I wrote kind of first in Blue Breeze, I kind of wish I could have that rage now, but like, mm -hmm. I'm I'm just too tired and overworked and like I have this like new white shirt and it's you know it's hard for me to be that angry <laughs> yeah that's so true um oh, sorry my um my dog keeps coming into the room I'll just show you because yeah, he's cute yeah. oh, he, did. he just keeps coming in for pets and every time my partner shuts the door to be like so he's doing something he just barrels through it I don't know how he does it now he's gone again um so if you see me like shaking it's because I'm patting the dog um, okay. off to the <laughs> this is just isolation life I think he's just um used to us all being around all the time um the other thing I'm gonna ask you, yeah I know I'm very lucky actually because I get to do um isolation with a cat and a dog and I also have a horse that lives like just down the road so yeah I know I have a horse um I saw her just today so I have to say like you 100% could not have the number of animals I have on a fully writing salary, <laughs> it would be impossible. So all right. of you, you know, aspiring and emerging writers, just be aware if you want a horse and a dog and a cat, you're just gonna have to get some kind of lucrative yeah. date. Yes, and a car, <laughs> yes, and a home. Um, um, just all the new white shirt, you know, all of these things, they yeah. cost money. Um, what I was gonna ask you about is the, um, going back to craft a bit and kind of the structure that you've chosen, um, essays are, you know, my preferred format, but they're also um, kind of newly popular again. Um, like we have some amazing essayists that, um, especially women essayists who have done an incredible job over, you know, many years of creating the form. And I'm thinking of people like obvious people like Joan Didion and um, Rebecca Solnit and essayists that I really love. Um, and the craft of an essay, I think, has started to come into its own again over the past kind of five or 10 years um, in Australia, especially I've noticed a lot of um, essay collections um, being published and actually being received by perhaps a wider section of um, the, the reading audience than they might have been in the past. Um, what appeals to you about essays as a form? And why do you think, um, I guess like a lot of people feel resistant to the idea of essays in a book um, when they're writing because 
it can seem hard to put them together. So like how did you conceptualize Blueberries as a book while writing individual chunks of it as essays, if that makes sense? The essay um, that I kind of, the way that I understand the essay is that it's a kind of, um, it's a very liberal, I mean, historically, but also it's a um, formally liberal genre in that you can take kind of anything into it. You can pull anything into it. Um, it's referential. It's like, it's true. You know, it's, it's written under the burden of fact, um, but it doesn't like, you're still allowed to, to kind of do hypothetical thinking mm -hmm. um, and speculative thinking and talk about dreams and talk about crushes and talk about anything high, low, I don't know, like whatever you want, you can kind of move through. But all it demands of you is that there's some kind of, um, there's some vocal consistency. There's a kind of clear idea of who's speaking and why. Um, and beyond that, it's like a free for all. So that's mm -hmm. why I really like working uh, with the essay because it kind of, um, it adequately kind of, it, it gives me kind of a framework through yeah. which I can examine all of the things that I want to examine, which might be, um, you know, kind of, what am, what am I, like, it, yeah, it might, <laughs> it might be institutions. And that's yeah, like, it's to say writing an essay about institutions, but the way in which I'm writing it allows for this kind of like um, mm -hmm. formal play and jokes and dirty and maybe it's more possible because um, like you say, an essay gives you a framework. It gives you um, kind of like a container to hold the, the ideas and the thoughts and it feels more um, manageable in a lot of ways, particularly when the ideas are so big. Um, it gives you a place to kind of go because you know that you're trying to communicate what you're trying to communicate within a more set um, number of words. Like it's not it doesn't sprawl in the same way. Um, and I kind of, I love that. And I also like that as a reader. I really enjoy reading essays because I feel like I get to have this fully formed sense of what the author is trying to communicate in this little like nugget of excellence, but I can hold it like one at a time as opposed to um, kind of, I guess like, you know, when you start reading a really amazing book and you don't, you're like, I don't want to put this down because if I put it down, I'll lose the where my brain is going with these thoughts and these ideas. and. Um, that can be quite a difficult thing to kind of retain across a whole um, book that's one single narrative. Yeah, and that's like why I'm kind of interested. Like memoir is like part of the kind of essaying that I do because mm -hmm. I'm like I'm interested in you know like I get a lot of my ideas from you know I've studied like literary theory and I read philosophy, um, but often um, reading really kind of abstract theoretical um literature mm. it's frustrating because it's like it's so removed from its context and mm. so i'm i'm really interested in how in the essay and when you're using a bit of memoir in the essay you are like trying to bring them back together and yeah. you're saying this is it like kind of ideas and the body are inextricable from each other mm. well what's interesting about that as well though is um like I quite like the way that you talk about writing as a craft in a very, um, in like quite an academic sense, you know, it is, it is a craft. Um, it isn't just the magic that happens when writers write. There's often a lot of thought and strategy that kind of goes into it. But at the end of the day, you're still creating something that is to be consumed. And, you know, hearing you talk about writing blueberries and then having the experience of reading it, um, it's, it flows very naturally. It's quite organic. And as a reader, you're kind of swept along on the journey. Um, in a way that feels quite effortless. Clearly it wasn't um, because you laid it over it. Um, but I guess coming to your book specifically, how have you felt people have engaged with it and how did you want people to engage with it? You know, like if you go back to Eleanor, um, say like four months ago when you were still a little bit away from having the book um, launched to the public, mm. at that point in time, what were you kind of hoping that people would take away from it? And was there anything that you were afraid that people wouldn't understand? I know that I had a lot of fears before yeah. my book came out because it is memoir and you do worry that people are going to um, people are going to judge you. Um, as you said, you know, at the very beginning of this chat, people won't understand you or your motivations. Um, how did you kind of tackle that as well in your thinking yeah I guess like uh I 
my only experience of a, a, no one wants to hear an author talk about like being badly reviewed like it's very obnoxious and stupid yes. <laughs> all just think about it all the time I remember like the only time my name ever appeared in like a book review before or you know like while I was writing Blueberry is the only time that it happened for me was in the Saturday paper and the first edition of the lifted brow that I had edited with my colleagues um it described me as a door bitch it said ignore the door bitch because I was the editor and I'd written an editorial so I had this like very um kind of profound fear that I would be kind of reviewed by someone like that like a man who kind of hates women who hates women who are trying to think and um and think using kind of um experimental or lyrical prose yeah so I was really yeah I was really worried and I was kind of like okay can I like tell my publicist that there are to be no men no men are allowed to like review my book but of course you can't and the first review that came out was Jordy Williamson and he wrote a really generous long review and I was like okay some men can review my book <laughs> <laughs> I know exactly what you mean though I actually um had one review of my book that um I didn't really I like other than Goodreads which you should never look at um I think it negative kind of criticism but um there was like one line also in a Saturday paper review and I can't remember it now because I've clearly repressed it um but it was something along the, oh it was like beyond the millennial hand wringing and I was like I'm sorry but my like <laughs> my deeply interrogated ideas and thoughts on like a race and religion would not pull in your hand reading. But then I was like, this is exactly what memoirs um, are confronted with, right? Is it's so personal when you get yeah. any feedback. And I will say that that was back when the Saturday paper had anonymous reviews and they, yeah, don't, do they don't do that anymore. They don't do that anymore, no. I think that's really good because it makes you feel so vulnerable. But then that's kind of what you sign up for, right? Like when you put a book out in the world, that doesn't change the fact that you feel um, quite vulnerable especially in the immediate few weeks or months of having your work out there and I know that yeah. for me the most rewarding thing was um hearing from actual readers so like your normal person not somebody from within the industry um yeah. who would react to the book and I guess I'm curious what you want those people to be feeling or what you hope that they kind mm -hmm. of take away because blueberries has a lot of there's a lot of content um yeah, and, and there are lots of different ways that can be read as well. I think that there's like there's something in there for a kind of more literary reader who's like looking for clues um, mm. and like can uh, use like critical language to describe some of the forms. But then there's also like um, really kind of um, there are raw elements of it that I think a lot of like women and young queer people probably have some like there's some commonality to the experience so there's like yeah. relatability so I, I feel like there's been yeah lots of different ways that people have engaged with it um but I also don't and I, I really appreciate all of the different ways in which people have started to engage with it because I don't mm. think it's like that I was writing for one reader I was I don't even know if I was writing for a reader I was kind of just trying to get this thing the way that I wanted to get it mm -hmm. Um, and I wanted a few people to like it and the few people who I wanted to like it liked it and then the rest of it is just like an extra kind of gift. Yeah. I yeah. ran into someone that I hadn't seen for like 10 years, a friend's little brother, and he had read it and I was just like, but you didn't have to, like you don't work in publishing, like this is not your obligation. <laughs> I just felt totally astounded that a person in the normal world was even had any idea that this book existed. So that was a gift. Oh, yeah. There are like strangers holding your book right now. Like they might even be reading it like right now and you don't even know. Um, that's like the weird reality, right? I had, um, I found out from uh, like right after my book came out, there's like a couple of bits where I talk about um, like high school and some of the like, oh, I don't think I actually talk about like any of the like shocking bullying that my entire friendship group experienced during high school, which we didn't really care about that much, but other people always seem appalled when we tell them about it. But then I found out that a group of people that I went to high school with had like read the book and then sat around being like, oh my God, are we like, are we the bullies that, <laughs> that Zoya writes about in a book? And I remember being like, this is the most meta experience I think I'll ever have. Like, you know, wow. 
if only I could have known then what I know now. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a surreal, surreal experience. Do you feel like you had a taste of that from publishing, um, you know, shorter pieces and um, pieces of work widely before that? Do you think that um, anything really prepares you for having a full length memoir out in the world? No. And I, I mean, I guess maybe the, like there are so many bad things about being a person who writes for small literary journals for like a hundred dollars here and there, you know, it's not a sustainable career path. Um, but one of the like benefits of kind of coming up in that world is that like you get, uh, you get a chance to develop your craft and figure out what you really want to write by publishing stuff that you later regret. And so, and, and you kind of like get to do all this without a huge audience. Mm. Imagine if I, yeah, gone, been luckier or like more popular as a writer in my early career, I might be facing some, um, some deep shame now, but I kind of yeah. just give myself my early bad writing and I'm glad I had those experiences. And now it's like, yeah, it's a, I now have a different audience because I have a book. It's, it's also a bit annoying to me. I'm like, don't you, you, all you people who read books, like, don't you know that there are other things that you can read? There are lots of little journals. Yeah. Why don't you buy some of them? Yeah, totally. You feel like kind of linking people to everything else, being like, okay, well, I don't know if you saw this other thing that I wrote two years ago that I'm actually still quite proud of, but I won't find it in a book store. Um, this is kind of unrelated to memoir, but I just think it's interesting and I've been thinking about it a lot, um, which is, you know, we're in this kind of digital world now and, you know, we're literally doing this event online and um, weirdly it was one of the few events that was always going to be online <laughs> regardless of what's happening in the world. And, um, you know, we most of what we write as writers in um, in the world today ends up being printed digitally, you know, like... There are very few things really that end up in print. And yet there's something really like unique and magical about an actual book um, and seeing uh -huh. your work in an actual book. Um, did you feel that? Like, did you feel like that thrill of excitement when you found it? Yeah. Yeah, it totally, it's so much realer. Um, also because it's been mediated by a publishing house and that somehow it shouldn't feel different, but it does. Oh, totally. Like someone had to actually typeset the boring page on the inside cover that has like the ISBN and the copyright date, you know, oh, like, yeah, wild. It's wild. Um, <laughs> <laughs> do you, um, did you see yourself when you first started writing as always wanting to be the writer of books? Yeah. I didn't know what kind of books though. I was, um, I was telling someone recently, I like, when I was about 19 and I was writing poetry, I read Portrait of the Artist as a young dog. The, um, what's his name? Dylan Thomas. Mm -hmm. And he like put his first collection out to critical acclaim when he was like 23 or 24 or something. I remember thinking then, I'm like, okay, I've got four years to write my debut collection. It's on. It's like me and the clock now. Um, but I didn't really have the the kind of skill then or the discipline to do it. But yeah, I think I like had been working with the idea in my head that I want to write books from a pretty young age. Mm. I find it really interesting when people say things like that, like, cause I was a lot like that too. I always wanted to like have my first book published by a certain age and that seemed really important to me. And then I remember when I was working on um, the first draft of, um, the first draft of the first book I ever wrote and that was it hasn't been published but was the book that um actually got me signed to right. my agent and that kind of led to my memoir um I remember writing it and feeling like this is never gonna happen I think I was probably like 26 or 27 at the time and um then I like googled a bunch of writers that I really love to make sure that they were older than me <laughs> when they <laughs> when they got successful and one of the writers I really like, um, who is Cheryl Strayed, and I talk about her all the time to um, the toolkits participants, so they'll know um, that I'm flat obsessed. But she did not have her memoir published until she was like in her 40s. And I still hold that as like a kind of comforting thought sometimes. Because every time I get another year older, and you know, I'm 30 now, so I get to, um, I get to another birthday, and I just think to myself, like, there's my yet again one more year gone proves that I'm not going to be like this young savant who like like yeah. bursts on 
very seen with just like constant success. Um, and I do think that we place weird limits around our um, ability to be like what success looks like. Um, when we're dreaming about being successful, what we think that looks like is actually really different from the reality of it. And even the things that we value once we are quote unquote successful um, are really different from what we thought that we would value. So I guess now that you've achieved this milestone of having your book published, what do you see as like your goals as a writer going forward? Do you know what you want to, um, like what drives you, I guess, to keep writing? Uh, I, I'm lucky that I really enjoy writing. Um, when I have like time to get into it and time to not be distracted by other things, I really enjoy the process. It gives me a lot of um, satisfaction as a human being, even if I'm producing stuff that's like not that good or maybe not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. I just really enjoy doing it. Even yeah. So that's probably what drives me. And then the other thing is like reading and um, and reading like a writer, like reading and thinking like, how is this happening? Like, what what mm. is happening on this page? And trying to figure it out. It's a it's a really intellectual exercise for me. And yeah, I just really enjoy it. Well, you you're motivated by the right things. Um, I have questions coming in from Twitter. Um, so the first question is, how do you negotiate how honest or how much of yourself you expose through memoir? Is there different boundaries for presenting yourself in memoir opposed to other people? So how you present yourself versus the other people who appear in your work? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, I, <coughs> I mean you're in control of your, your self-disclosures in memoir, and that's something that's really important is that like, I mean, we talk about this when I'm teaching creative nonfiction, we talk about ethics like all day, every day. And we're always thinking about like, how to not do harm to the people that you're um, writing about or writing, you know, like even referencing conversations you had 10 years ago. How do you represent those? If you, if you can't get in touch with the person you had that conversation with, you don't even remember their name. How do you make sure that you're representing them in a way that's that's not kind of harming them even symbolically, right? Mm. But a part of that is that you also have to be ethical towards yourself and mm. you have to not exploit yourself. You have to be really um, confident and comfortable in how much you're disclosing about your life. Um, and because you're the writer, you have the tools at your disposal to, um, to, really, to be really selective about what you're giving away. Um, mm. Obviously, you don't you don't get to make those choices about when you're representing other people. Um, they have some say in that. And so when you're working with other people, like the good thing to do is to hit them up and just send them like what you've written about them and make sure that they're like fine with it. Um, most of the time, if it's just like friends conversations, there's no real like issues going on there. Um, there is one exception for that for my personal practice, which is if someone's harmed you, they don't get mm -hmm. to determine um, how you represent them. They've kind of foregone that right by by harming you. Mm, I think that's um, actually a really powerful way of looking at it. Um, how about when you represent yourself though, which is kind of the first part of that question. How do you um, how do you try and have some objectivity to that, but also like what are the things that you, um, how do you set boundaries for what you do and don't share? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I actually... My supervisor in my PhD gave me a really good trick, um, which I will pass on to you. And it's that in your first draft, you write everything. Like you write the ugly things, you write the embarrassing things, um, you write the things that will hurt other people that you know you think all the time, but you have no business writing down. And then as you're kind of doing the sculpting work of rewriting and editing, you take out all of that kind of slanderous evil material, but the energy of, the thought and the the memories is in mm -hmm. there and that's that's been really helpful for me so that's one yeah of the you kind of have to be honest with the page before you can then kind of be critical and decide what should and shouldn't remain yeah. on there yeah I often um say that to people as well when I'm teaching courses um that if you're feeling uncomfortable about writing something sometimes you actually need to just lean into that discomfort and get it down because you don't know what's lurking kind of in there and often I have to like write my way through to the idea that I'm actually trying to communicate and sometimes that means writing a whole bunch of uncomfortable stuff that I don't that I never want anyone to see but um but that was necessary to kind of get to that point yeah I think you see I mean there are so many good memoirs that kind of 
get to the awkward place and like stay there mm. um, avoiding themselves and like one of them is um maxine benever clark's memoir the hate race mm, definitely yeah definitely and there are things in that book that um you know i've i've had the like pleasure of talking to maxine about her book on um at events as well and one of the things i really admire is the way that she doesn't flinch from putting um you know uncomfortable things that she has done or things that yeah. she has put onto the page to help broaden that conversation around um you know racism and race relations and um, yeah. yeah that's such a crucial part of it um so we have another question um here for you eleanor that's nice to look at who are your other favorite non-fiction or memoir writers and also they loved your book which is great and we should definitely say that um, well, if you've read my book, you'll see in the back there's a work cited page. And so a lot of the um, the works that have kind of influenced me directly are in there. Um, some of my favourites, I really like Svetlana Alexievich. Um, I really love Banu Kapil. I really love, um, I love Hilton Olds. Mm -hmm. I love. Hang on, I'm just looking at my thing. <laughs> oh, I love Eugene Lee's um, most recent, or oh, her like essay collection. It's so amazing. Um, I really like Jamaica Kincaid's one of my favorite authors. Mm -hmm. um, nonfiction, what else is there? Maria Tamarkin, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, and Maggie Nelson. Um, who else is in here? You get the picture. Mm, that's interesting. I thought about the Argonauts when I was reading your book. Mm. Maggie Nelson. Yep. <laughs> She's all right. Yeah, I like her a bit. <laughs> but I think I also have a lot of, um, I'm influenced by a lot of kind of more scholarly reading as well. And so there are some, um, I guess there are some of them included in that um, citations list. Um, but I, uh, what's her name? Uh, Dory Lorb and I like they're in there. Mm -hmm. so, do you, what do you say to um, people who say that they don't like reading in the genre that they're writing because they worry that um, it'll like unduly influence their work as they might start writing in the voice of another writer? I think I asked this to um, Amra Payalik as well last week. I have no thoughts or feelings about that. I feel like um, I read for inspiration and so. I find it really um, important to my practice to I, I sometimes read someone that I'd love to write like to kind of break me out of a funk. I've just yeah. read Mary Rufel today to kind of, because I have these like commissions at the moment because my book's out. I have to write all these like personal essays for the internet and I'm like, oh, I don't know how to like uh, churn out another one. So I'm trying to like interrupt that by um, reading some really poetic, interesting prose from Mary Rufel. To well, that's good advice. Um, definitely for if you're experiencing a bit of writer's block to kind of deliberately go and read something that's quite inspiring. Yeah. Um, just checking if there are any more Twitter questions. Oh, nope, there aren't any. Um, I've got a chat function here, so I'm not just talking to my talking to myself there. <laughs> um, well, I guess as a kind of um, final question for the, for the live stream portion, um, are there things that you're doing, things that you're publishing in the next... Um, little while that people who want to follow the book and want to learn more about your writing can tune in for or look for. Um, and I assume that like people can order blueberries through all of your normal excellent bookstores. Um, and I highly encourage people to do that. Whether you get an ebook, I personally prefer a printed book um, because it's very pretty um, and it's a nice thing to be able to touch and hold on to in these strange times. But yeah, what are some of these pieces that are coming out or are there anything, any other online events that you're doing? Um, I have, I have not, mm, nothing that I need to publicize right now. Um, I have a, an, a newsletter, which I try to write in every week. So sometimes I love, you know, every 10 days or so, um, it's called little throbs and in there I'll like, I sometimes point to things that are happening in my real life. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's great. And where can people sign up to that? Um, you can there's a link to it on my website, which is elenasavage.com. That's probably you see your, like visible discomfort at saying that. Like you look so I'm like, oh, I'm embarrassed by promoting myself. This is your life now. Like you're a published author. You just have to do that all the time. Oh my god. Well, thank you everyone so much 
for joining us. Thank you so much to Express Media for hosting these awesome chats. It's such a privilege to be able to um, to talk to excellent writers that I admire. And um, don't forget, to, if you love this and you want to share it with people, it'll be up on YouTube so that you can share the link around. Um, and Toolkit's participants, we'll see you over in Google Hangouts very shortly. Um, but thank you again, Eleanor. Ciao.